So hello everyone. Uh, we are going to talk about why and how you should consider transforming your REST API into a data streaming API. Uh, so quickly to introduce myself, my name is Audrey. I'm developer relations at StreamData.io. I'm although the co-leader in France of DevOx for Kids, which is a very cool initiative to teach kids programming. And you can find me on Twitter with this handle. So, modern times. We know that for the last few years, internet has been more and more consumed on mobile devices, finally exceeding desktop consumptions about two years ago. So we know applications that we develop have to be mobile ready, even businesses one, due to the bring your own device movement. The problem is, the market application is now completely full. It becomes very hard for new applications to acquire users and even more to retain them. So we need to make our users addict. And we know that to keep our user interest alive, animation is the key. That's the reason why I'm using GIF instead of button points, even if I know you are all completely mad of button points, but sorry. Uh, but do you know why? Well, it's because of evolution. But actually, when I say evolution, it's a little bit older than this. Um, this little guy here has learned something very important. If it moves, it can be two things, food or danger. So in past case, it might, worrying, it might worth worrying a little bit about. And that's the reason why our brain is so addicted to things that change. If it's dead, no interest, the cat is looking away. So on the UI part of our applications, usually it's fine. We already know how to animate them. We got CSS3, every mobile framework has animated components. Even Material Motion has a dedicated part on animation. And the interesting thing when you're reading uh, at Material Motion guidelines is that one of the reasons why they recommend to animate our applications is to hide from the user what's going on behind the scene. Yeah, because the problem comes with refreshing data. So when it comes to animate data, usually it begins with a lovely refresh button, uh, which is not the best way to start our relationship with the user, actually. Uh, the user has to interact as less as possible with our application. And the problem with the refresh button is that usually it comes with what I will call the loader screen of the dead. And the, if this loader screen stays for too long, well, actually the user will be fed up. It could simply leave the applications and perhaps never come back. So, repeat after me, refresh button is available, we stop using refresh button. We need to find another solution. And actually, this solution is real-time. It's what successful applications are using, some of them are completely built upon it. Um, I took here as example Uber and WhatsApp and Twitter, but I could have mentioned Waze and Slack and Google Drive, so it's already in our day-to-day -day lives and that's what users are expecting from our application. So basically, what you, what you need is simply turning your static API into a stream of data. So how can you do that? Well, usually when we are talking about real-time solutions, um, we mention polling and its lovely variant, the long polling. Who knows polling? Yeah, a lot of you. Um, WebSocket? WebSocket is very famous. Who knows? Yeah, almost the same number. And server sentiments, so who knows server sentiments? Great. Not that much person and I'm not surprised. So polling actually is this. I'm making a request, waiting for the answer, sending the same request again, waiting for the answer, and so on and so forth. Well, uh, it's very the long polling, it's just blocking the request until the server has new data to send, so it's not really better. So it's the same as the refresh button, it's not a solution, you, it's not a viable solution for a mobile application. How are you going to deal with connection loss? You will probably make useless calls, you will retrieve empty calls, empty response, or the same data a few times. It's definitely not a solution. True solutions exist, hopefully. Uh, they are called push technologies. Both are under, under W3C uh, specifications and they appeared around the same period, even if WebSockets is much, much more known than uh, service sentiments. But if both exist, you can guess that there are some difference between. Um, so probably the biggest difference between both is that uh, WebSockets is bidirectional. So basically, it allows both the client and the server to send data to each other, whereas server sentiments is unidirectional. It opens a channel where data can be streamed from the server to the client. 
The second big difference is that um, WebSockets can handle both text and binary, whereas server sent events only handle text. Uh, looking at protocols, uh, so WebSockets has its own protocol, which is a TCP-based one, but its only uh, relationship with, with HTTP is that its end check is interpreted as an upgrade request by server. So basically, the server will um, resemble both HTTP requests and WebSockets requests on the same port and switch to a binary uh, bidirectional protocol, which, does not which has nothing to see with HTTP anymore. Server sentiments. Uh, it completely relies on HTTP. So basically, you just need to add the text event stream, event stream uh, content type you're seeing it here to your header, and it works. It means that for configuration, obviously, you need, when using WebSockets, you need to reconfigure proxies and load balancer, which is something ops are not really fond of most of the time. Um, and there is a reason why. It's because a lot of proxy don't handle WebSockets very well, so it can be a real nightmare to, co to support them properly. Uh, on server sent events, obviously, it should be you don't have anything else to do. Looking at messages format, so um, nothing is defined for a WebSocket. There's nothing written about uh, the, the message, of, um, the format message should have in WebSocket, so it's up to you to define your own message. It's up to you to re-implement all the logic behind to parse it in both ways. Uh, in server sent events, we got a field called data. So every message you need to send should begin with this prefix, and it works. It can be a single line of text, multiple line of text, it can be a JSON object. But the most interesting thing is that we're having three of the fields defined. The ID field, the event field, and the retry field. Keep them in mind, we will talk about them a little bit later. Looking at implement implementation, so here I took a JavaScript example for a customer. It's almost the same for every language. Um, you're going to see it's very similar. Both are very similar. It's quite nice. Uh, looking at WebSockets, to start a WebSockets uh, session, we're going to create a WebSocket object and pass the URL, the API we want to stream, basically, as a parameter with the WS prefix for the protocol. For server sent events, uh, we are going to create an event source object, and it's the same. It takes the API as parameters, but with the HTTP or HTTPS protocol. Then you can register to different callback. The first one you can register to is on open, which can be very useful, um, especially for web sockets, because opening a connection is made asynchronously. It's prone to error. You probably want to be sure that the connection is really opened before trying to send data to the server. Then you can register to the on-message callback. So this one is pretty obvious. So as mentioned previously, nothing is defined for WebSockets. It's up to you to re-implement all the logic. And on event source, you're just going to um, retrieve your data object and pass it. And then you can register, obviously, to an error to listen what's, what, to what happened if something goes wrong for any reason. But the interesting thing there is that uh, service and events does not only allow to listen to uh, messages, it also allows us to listen to arbitrary event. So if you remember the event field I've mentioned previously, by adding it to your message, you're giving a type to your message. And whereas you're not interested by listening all messages coming in, or perhaps you want to make a different treatment in function of the type of message you received, you can make it easily by adding an event listener on this type of event. So now, what's happening if we lost the connection? Because talking about streaming, obviously we need to take care of what's going on if the connection is dropped for any reason. Unfortunately, in WebSockets, nothing is configured, nor nothing is defined, so it's up to you to re-implement all this logic. In server sent events, we can combine two really cool features. So the first one is the reconnection timeout. It means that if the connection is dropped for any reason, the browser will automatically try to reconnect after three seconds. And if you want to change this delay, you can do it by adding the retry field we've, added, we've seen previously. And then you can also, um, if you remember the ID field we've seen previously, so you can add it to each of your message, defining a specific ID for your message, which will allow the browser to specify the last event ID received to the server. 
so that the server will be able to resend all from that point. Uh, looking at browser supports, WebSocket is natively supported by all browsers for a very long time. Uh, server sentiments on this side is only supported by modern browsers, so obviously not by uh, Internet Explorer, <coughs> which actually is not a problem because we get polyfills, so we can handle both older versions of other browsers and Internet Explorer. And looking at age at the moment, it's under consideration. Looking at mobile browser support, so it's the same in both cases, only Ampera does not support them. Um, so now, looking at performances, I took these um, numbers from Matthias Nelson blog post, which was written in 2013. So Matthias is the developer of an application called BotWatch, uh, which allowed to visualize stream of tweets in real time. So his needs was to preload 500, um, 500 tweets as fast as possible in his, uh, it's a play web application. So he started with WebSockets and very quickly he encountered too many issues because of the proxy configuration. So he decided to give a try to service and events and then make this bench to be sure that performance was not um, worse than before. And so first of all, he was a little bit surprised to realize that for the, the implementation of the same technology on, on different browsers, we can have so big differences. Uh, and then he noticed that server sentiments was faster. And actually, the funny thing is that it took him much time writing this blog post than to write the impl server sentiment implementation. So as often in programmation, there is no good or bad choice. It's just the choice which will fit your need. So it's up to you to choose wisely. If you're going to make a chat or a video game uh, application, obviously, WebSockets will be useful. But if you, if you need is just to send data, text data from the server to the client, well, probably server sent events is a wisest choice. choice. So that's the reason why we built streamdata.io, which is a proxy as a service. Um, so it's a proxy available in SaaS mode. It works with any JSON API. It's completely based on service sent event. And we added two features. We added first a dynamic catchy, so that every customer joining the session doesn't have to wait until the next poll. It can just retrieve the last data that has been polled. We will take care of everything uh, which could be a problem if you were doing it manually, so errors and all those kind of things. And we're going to make incremental updates. So it means that if, for example, as on, it happens on pull request number two, nothing has changed, we will not send you anything. And if, if let's imagine on pull request number three, only a part of the data has changed, we are going to send you just this part. So to do that, we're using JSON patch. Uh, so JSON patch basically defines a set of operations which can be applied on a JSON document. So it can be replaced, remove, copy, move, delete, Etc. There is six um, at all. So let's imagine that the first snapshot of data we received, but on the second call, only two values have changed. You will receive this instead of the whole document again. And then you can simply apply a JSON patch library to update your original document with changes. So it significantly reduces the amount of data exchanged and the number of calls uh, which, which is made. That means that, for example, for um, so that's a real use case. That's um, the one of our, one of our customer, which has an uh, investment mobile app. So that's only uh, the Android numbers. So it received 25 billion calls per month, and with putting the proxy in front of, of its um, API, it reduced by 90% the outgoing traffic and API server load. So basically, they were paying $9,000 per month, and now they are paying 900. And they gain six months acceleration in development as you don't, it's uh, serverless. You don't need to change anything in your code. So enough talking, let's go to a demo. Um, so I got this lovely drone there, uh, which I would like to uh, make fly on real-time data. So I take here this uh, API, which gives me the, the rate, um, the, the last rate of Bitcoin has been sold in Euro. So the data which is going to interest here is the last data which you can see there. So taking this API, I'm going to create a new application. Let's call it demo. So, yeah. And 
I can simply paste my uh, API there. So I can see a token has been generated, which is related to my application. And now I'm going to copy paste this call command there, which is the complete call, complete call to the proxy with the API and my token, and paste it there so we can see what it looks like when we start streaming it. So here we received a first event called data, which got a specific ID. And once we've done that, we can just go back to the My API section and configure the polling frequency. So here, for example, I would like to poll every second this API. Obviously, if you get HTTP headers or query parameters, you can add there too. And if I'm coming back there, I can see that the polling frequency has already been updated without closing and refreshing the, the stream. And here, the two points you're seeing, it means that there is no data, it's just a heartbeat to keep the connection open. Great, so now we can go back to the code. So, uh, it's a basic... Oh, it's a basic Node.js application. Uh, I only got three things there, the three library I'm going to use. So I got an event source library, a JSON patch library, and a, an IR drone library to pilot the drone. So first of all, I will need a drone client. So let's call the create client method with an option object. Um, I'm not using the, um, the IP, the default IP, so I have to re-specify re it. Okay, fine. So now I'm going to create my event source object. So we're going to call it event source and create a new event source. And it, need, it needs a new URL as parameter, so I'm going to just copy paste the URL which was given to me in the portal to try the the streaming session. And once this is done, I can register to call back. So I'm going to add a, an event listener on the data event. Um, so this one is, will retrieve a snapshot of data. I'm going to store data received. I'm going to store the last value. So here, um, my data object will be json.parse snapshot.data. My last object will be data.last. And I'm going to ask the drone to take off. OK. And I'm going to add a console.log just to see what's going on. Um, so let's call it first patch, for example. First last, sorry. And last. OK, now I'm going to add another event listener. Uh, on the patch event. So this one is going to retrieve patches. So there I'm going to store it in a temporary object. So json.parse patches.data. And then I'm going to use my json patch library to apply changes to the data object. So it's quite simple, I just have to do that. Uh, so at this point, the data object has been updated. We can log what it looks like. By calling data.last. And here we are going to start the comparison. So if the last object we received initially is under the data.last object, it means that the Bitcoin value has gone under, um, has gone up, sorry. So we are going to uh, tell the drone to go up at a speed of 0.5, going to level 2. Um, and I think the floor, the ceiling is high, high enough so that I can make it, um, make it flip. So I'm going to call animate. I'm not sure of what <laughs> it looks like, but let's try it. Uh, so it's going to be a flip ahead for one second. OK, then, if it's not the case, it means that the Bitcoin is going down, and so the drone will. And we are going to say console.log down. 
Fine. Then we reassign the last value. And we can continue. So finally, I will just add an event listener on the uh, error event, just in case. Because if something bad happens, I would like the drone to land. Could be a good idea. Um, obviously, I would like to know what happened. And I'm going to close my event source. And I need the demo to stop at a point, so I'm going to uh, call the meta drone after 30 seconds. And it's almost the same that happened in the error method. But we are going to say, time's up. OK. So that's my code, pretty simple. Um, <coughs> I can let the battery on because I'm a little bit too talkative for him. So. Mm. Okay. So I'm sorry, it looks like, ah, yeah, good. So I need it to initialize itself. This is done. So I'm just going to check that I can connect to it. Uh, Fine. Well, no. It's a little bit lazy today. Sorry? No, it's already done. Um, I'm connected. Well, yeah, I guess my connection, um, my sharing connection has been lost. So we're going to, I'm going to remake it, start, because it's, uh, it's um, on point. So I need to connect my laptop, laptop to the drone to be able to send it data. That will be probably better. Okay. I'm on my, my phone connection, so I think it's just not that powerful. Mm. Okay. I'm going to try to run it to see if it makes something. So I'm simply running node main.js. Okay, so we are receiving data, but it, it, does, it does not take off. Is it still on? Yeah, it's on, it's just not connecting. So, last is done. Hmm. Okay. Gonna try to restart it. Try something else. <laughs> Sorry, can't hear you. Yeah, um, I don't know. Don't know which one. Um, da, da, da. Mm. Okay. Trying to set up the Wi-Fi on my um, telephone in case it's just the network. Well, I hope it's just the network because I can. I have no idea what else it could be. Let's get 
Sorry. Um, the IP address of my Mac. Um, if config. Uh, da, 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 da. Can't see it. Well, I'm really sorry <laughs> that the first time it happens. Um, we're, al we're almost out of time, Audrey. Yeah, we are running out of yeah. time, I fear. Yeah. I'm really sorry. 